Amen. The verse that I'd like to focus on, and first off, I'd just like to th say thank you all for having me out today. It's a blessing to be out here and meet all of you again. And I know I was out here just over a year ago, and it was a great time of fellowship and seeing a lot of familiar faces. And so it really is neat to see everybody once again. The part of the chapter that I'd like to focus on is just one verse. It's verse 1. The Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. I don't know about you guys, but when I look outside, you know, it's kind of a rainy day today, but still, even on a rainy day, we get to see the beauty of the nature of, of God. I mean, we get to see just this beautiful creation that he's made, whether it's sunny outside, whether it's stormy outside, whether it's wintertime, summertime, harvest. God's creation is amazing. And I think that it's a shame that people have taken away from his creation. And they've turned it into, the Bible says, that they have worshiped and served the creature more than the creator in some instances. So let's go ahead and pray, and we're going to go ahead and get this sermon rolling. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time that we get to be in the house of God and amongst people that are like-minded. And Lord, I just pray that you'd speak through me today and that you'd hide me behind the cross and that I would say what you want me to say in this message. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I did some research recently, and 30,000 college students were interviewed, and these were college students that actually grew up in a Christian home. So a lot of people like you and I out there, for those of you who've grown up in Christian homes. And interestingly enough, uh, out of the 30,000 group people that left their faith, um, supposedly, a lot of them did leave their faith. They, some of them went to other faiths, but most of them became atheist or agnostic. And the most common theme, the interviewers asked these students, they said, hey, what's the number one thing that caused you to doubt your faith in God? And the, the, the people responded back. The majority said it was the Bible. The Bible caused us to doubt our faith. You see, our professor told us one thing over here, and the Bible is saying another thing over here, and we know that both can't be true. Which will we go with? And so people, and, and they got more specific. They said, what is it about the Bible that caused you to give up believing the Bible? Was there something in the Bible that caused you from, from uh, believing it? Does anybody want to guess what it was? What the number one reason people didn't believe the Bible was? It was the book of Genesis, 6,000-year-old earth. That was the number one reason that young people have given up their faith. Now, I would venture to say most of those young people were probably never saved, but they're all giving up their faith in God to believe in fantasies, folks. And I'm going to prove to you in this message, whether you're listening online or whether you're here in the audience and you struggle with your faith in God, I don't know if there's anybody in here that does, but a lot of people that become atheists were once sitting where you and I sit right here today. So I don't want to take a chance. I don't want to leave any shoelaces untied. I don't want to leave any stone unturned. I want to preach a message that's going to unconfuse the confused and make everything simple that people have complicated over time. If you look at the public, fool, the public school system, <laughs> the public fool system, really, um, you know, and I don't really like to call names, but it is what it is, right? I mean, let's call it out for what it is, folks. They're peddling a bunch of foolish lies down there at ASU in the public school system. And so um, let's compare the creation stories for a minute. So you've got the Bible's creation story that says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The Bible says that God spake the world into existence. That's powerful, amen? And so the Bible is my final authority. Well, what these professors will say is the Bible has no credit. We want to teach you something known as evolution and Big Bang cosmology. They like to use fancy words. And I love cosmology. I love, I love pretty much every field of science. We're going to look at all the fields real quick. Cosmology, zoology, geology, uh, just every single scientific field. And I'm going to prove to you that every single one of them points to creation, not evolution. And anybody that defends evolution has to do it dishonestly. If they know what the theory says, it's done in dishonesty. So the Big Bang Theory states that all of the matter in the universe was condensed down to an infinitesimal amount of space smaller than a single proton. So everything you see in this room, just imagine, folks, was all condensed down to a single proton, smaller than that, and then in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it went from the size of that tiny point to something billions of miles across. Who here thinks that's just logical and scientific? 
You know, it's funny. There's no such thing. There's no, there's a law in science about the speed of light. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Yet in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it went from that tiny point to something billions of miles across. That's millions of times faster than the speed of light. That's pathetic. So it should be rejected by the scientific community, but people are going to believe this because they want to believe what they want. They enjoy believing these things. Look, if I chose to believe what I wanted to believe, there's a part of me that doesn't want to believe in hell. I don't want some of my extended family to go there, but I believe in it because it's true and because God said it's true and because I am to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we shouldn't be basing our lives off of man's wisdom. And, you know, it's interesting. Let's, let's just falsify the Big Bang. Just prove that it's false. 326 million trillion gallons of water exist on our Earth alone. You realize water can only be compressed past a certain point. So who here thinks that 326 million trillion gallons of water can be compressed down to an infinitesimal amount of space smaller than a single proton? Does any, anybody want to vouch for evolution tonight, <laughs> this morning? Is anybody, I mean, we could enter into fantasy. You know what? Let's go into fantasy land where these people reside and just pretend that that's true. You know, they say nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, which is true. But has anybody ever observed an explosion construct a building? Imagine if, and, and, and get this too. What if I said nothing caused something behind this piano to explode? What if I said nothing caused it? You'd say, man, that's crazy. That's weird. But that's literally what they believe. They, they believe that nothing exploded and that there was no God. So nothing had to cause nothing to explode. That is bizarre. This isn't just unscientific. This is weird, folks. It's not just, you know, and they want to say the Bible strange. You know, when you ask, they'll, they'll come at you when you bring these facts to them. They'll say, well, you know, your Bible was written by a bunch of goat herders. And so, I, therefore, I can't trust it. Well, number one, you're proving that the Bible's historical and that it's been around for a long time, even since the goat herders, quote unquote. And then number two, why are you saying that all goat herders are bad? <laughs> are you just say, why are you saying that they're all bad people? You're just saying that all goat herders don't know anything, apparently, when a lot of them were some of the most, you look at the ancient Greeks, they were the most mathematically inclined people that existed on our planet. They came up with the most advanced mathematical equations that we use today, and people are going to say, oh, people back then didn't know what they were talking about. Come, let it, they say, don't you believe in reason? The Bible says, come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. You know, let's call these people to reason. They always want to get out on the street, and they want to have these, what's known as reason rallies. Have you guys ever heard of reason rallies? We, we see them often in Michigan, where they go out on the street, these atheists, and they hold up signs and they say like free thought, uh, good without God. And, and they hold up all these signs. Do you know how ridiculous that would look if we did that? Look at me, everybody. I believe in science. Like who's going to take you seriously if you do that? I mean, that's weird, isn't it? But it's because there, no alpha male would ever do that. You know, only people that are unsure of themselves and they just want confirmation. So they go around on the street and hold up a free thinker sign. Well, you know what? Free thought compares both sides of an equation. Evolution is the only theory protected by law, which means that you're actually not allowed to free think outside of evolution. So is that free thought? If I told my wife, honey, you can only cook with rice and beans, would she go into the kitchen and say, oh, I'm a free cooker. I can cook whatever I want. She wouldn't. Same thing with evolution. If it's the only theory protected by law, and here's the, here's the thing I want you to think about. If you have to have laws to protect your scientific theory from scrutiny, what does that tell you about your theory? Are you really allowed to be a free thinker? It's so funny. They're the biggest hypocrites in the world, folks. They say, well, we're free thinkers. No, you're not, because you're not allowed to free think outside of evolution in the realm of the classroom. So it's hypocritical for them to say that. And I heard one say to me recently, because, you know, when I bring these things up to them, they just come at me with the blanket statements that I have heard a million times. They'll say, well, you know, must take a lot of faith there to believe that, you know, that, that, that a virgin could conceive there, Matt. Look, these people think a rock conceived. 
Think about that. That's the fallacy of false equivalence. It's when they push their own propaganda onto the Christian worldview. They say, well, the Christians must have all these problems that they themselves have. They come up short in their worldview. They think they came from a rock. Why don't they get some respect for their ancestry? Look at the rocks outside. You could be walking on grandfather. <laughs> and you, the grass evolved from the rocks too. So for wherever you're walking, you might be walking on one of your ancient ancestors. They say, oh, the Bible's primitive superstition. No, you know what primitive superstition is? Saying that we came from primitive primates back in primitive times millions of years ago. That is primitive superstition. And look, I don't want you to be, I don't want you to be deceived, folks. These people that try to defend evolution, they say they'll use all these fancy names for all like the geologic column layers. They say you got Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and, and you know, all these zoic layers, and, and they try to speak over your head. Well, look, I could play that game with them, but I don't want to do that. The, you know, the Bible says that we should make everything simple. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11:3, it says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The Bible tells us that there's simplicity in Jesus. There's simplicity. It's not complicated. Put the cookies on the bottom shelf. You know, and if you're a teacher in the public school system, you should at least try to give the other side if it's legal in your state. In some states, they're saying, okay, you can give the other side as an alternative. Give the other side. They say, oh, we shouldn't push religion in schools. Well, okay, we should push nothing causing nothing to explode instead. And then tell you that that's science. And then tell you that there's laws to prevent you from thinking outside of it. It doesn't make any sense. First law, thermodynamics. Scientific laws are on our side as the Christian. My, my theory is consistent with every law of science. Theirs, they have to make believe. You ask them, ask an atheist sometime, what is the meaning of life? You guys ever asked an atheist that? You know what they always say? They always say, well, my meaning of my life is whatever I make up. Do you realize that they're admitting that they're making up or make believing a purpose for life? That's make believe. They say the Bible's make believe. Oh, really? Is that why 98% of scholars believe Jesus existed? The Bible is just a book of fiction. Is that why we have proof of a global flood? Now, there are some things I don't, I don't go as far as to say I can prove these things. I don't say I'm going to prove the Bible's true. We accept that the Bible's true by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 3. All right. But, I, but there are things that I can prove. I can prove scientifically a young earth, and I can prove scientifically at a global flood. Those things can be proved scientifically. Chapter 3, verse number 3, it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So they're willingly ignorant of the flood, is what it's saying. So they're willingly ignorant of the creation, coming judgment, and the flood. Now, one of the things that, whenever I bring these facts forward to these atheists or these non-believers, they try to come up with rebuttals that they claim are scientific. And, um, you know, I always ask them, do you think matter and energy created itself? And by the way, the title of my message is God or magic? Because remember, anybody that believes that natural causes could create themselves or that matter and energy could create itself believes in magic. That's magic. Th just think about the concept of the Big Bang. Poof, magic. It's an imagination. That's all it is. It's a rabbit being pulled out of a hat. You know, it's just like, you know, and so I bring these facts forward to them. I just say, well, do you think matter and energy created itself? Or do you think that something 
outside of matter and energy brought it into existence, which is consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. They'll say, well, Matt, it's possible that the universe is eternal. Because you're right, Matt, there must be something out there that's eternal, and we don't want to attribute it to God. So let's just say that matter and energy are eternal, that everything we see in nature has always existed. Well, let, let's go back to fantasy land and pretend that that's true. Comets and stars. Now, before I get into that, let's say I have a, a cup of hot water and a cup of cold water, and I let them sit here. What's going to happen to those? They're going to equal out over time, right? The temperature is going to become the same. Well, right now in our galaxy, we have comets, which are balls of ice floating through space. They're melting away. We have balls of fire that are... Uh, deteriorating and burning down. If the universe is eternal, why do we still have balls of fire in space burning up? Why do we still have comets going about in their orbit? Why? If, if the universe was eternal, we'd reach a point of equilibrium. By the way, we wouldn't even be here. The planets would be out of orbit. Everything would be a mess. Life wouldn't even be able to exist. So when they say, the universe is eternal, I just ask them, what, what celebrity have you been listening to? Because they get it from celebrities. They don't get it from science. And then they say, oh, well, you're just afraid to be investigated. No, the truth fears no investigation. Ask me any question you want. I'll avoid foolish questions, but at the end of the day, if it falls in the realm of science, I will find an answer. And you'll see that the answers are consistent with everything that we see in the world. So in verse 3, it says that there is scoffers, and these people mock us. They make fun of us. You go down to the public school system, and you talk to these non-believers, and it's becoming more and more people, which is why I think we have to have more and more preaching on it. They scoff. They mock at you. But they don't even know what evolution teaches. Evolution. Now, some of the stuff I'm about to share with you is very hokey. I do not believe these things, <laughs> okay? But this is what evolution actually teaches. So <clears throat> recently they did a study on man's anatomy in, in regards to the face of man. And they, they were wondering, since we supposedly evolved from monkeys, how we got facial hair or how we ended up having facial hair that grows out down here. Evolution literally teaches that our face and that our hair was created as a cushion and that we were actually punched to the point where natural selection had to create a cushion in our face. That is weird. You, I mean, you look at what happens to UFC fighters when they get in the ring and they have a beard. Look at what they did to Jesus. They ripped his beard out. It just, I mean, if you get punched in the face... It's going to cause your beard to deteriorate. But they make it out like it's just going to cause natural selection. That's their God. Natural, And it's funny, the name natural selection. Natural selection. It proves that intelligence selects genes. Who gave it that ability to select? The gene code. They say natural selection. So by all these punches, somehow we've got this nice beard in our face. Man, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Who turned the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like unto corruptible man and worshiped the beast and served the creature rather than the creator. That's what these people are. And, you know, they scoff at us and they mock us, but they don't even know that. They, they, like, you bring this stuff up, they're like, whoa, where's that at? And then supposedly they give up believing in the Bible when they don't even know what the Bible says half the time. Look, if you know what the Bible says, you're not going to be deceived. Light has come into the world. Jesus said, thy word is truth. They also teach that the reason that, because remember, we are primates, according to evolution. So we are just advanced monkeys. Now, <clears throat> I have seen some interesting evidence that these evolutionists point to for their theories. But this one they have no evidence for, and this is one that just came out. They say that the reason that we lost our ape hair is because apes started sewing and knitting clothes. 
<laughs> so they didn't need their hair anymore. <laughs> Isn't that insane? Like, what, what, what were you drinking last? <laughs> we need to get you checked up. Are you doing all right? They said apes started wearing clothes. Look, you look at them up in the mountains where it's freezing. They don't need a jacket. They just sit there. You could put them up in the mountains in the freezing areas. You could put them over in the Sahara Desert, and they might sweat a little bit, but they'll just sit there. They're monkeys. For crying out loud. And these people are teaching that we evolved from these primates. Primitive superstition. Yeah, that's primitive superstition. Primates becoming humans. Fish to fishermen. I always like to ask these people, do you believe your ancient ancestor was a fish? I wish, I wish I were a fish. Well, according to evolution, you were a fish millions of years ago. That's your grandfather. So every time you go fishing, you could be catching a, a distant cousin or, you know, your, your, your unknown brother-in-law from another uh, uh, life form there. Folks, it's weird. It's not just unscientific. It's weird. They say, oh, the Bible's weird. No, it isn't. Every single claim that the Bible makes in regards to science is legitimate. God, you know, they say science. I, I was getting ready for a debate one time, and they say scientific and uh, religious leaders getting ready to debate evolution. I said, what in the world? I'm not just religious. I, I believe in science, too, okay? And by the way, if you're an atheist, you don't believe in science, period. Because if you believed in science, you would believe that matter and energy can't create itself. And therefore, you would believe that somebody created it. I always like to ask these people, do you think an explosion out of chaos produced order? In violation of the second law? The, Bible, the, the second law of thermodynamics says that everything's tending towards chaos. The sun's getting smaller. The moon's getting further from Earth. The Earth is slowing down. They always say, give it more time and everything will happen. Like, you know, you can have fish to fishermen over time, bacteria to biologists. Just give us more time. Time is their God. Okay, let's give them more time. The sun's burning down. The moon's getting further from Earth. The Earth's slowing down. Things are heading to a point where we can't even live. So just give it more time. If we give it more time, it's going to be bad. Evolution can't work. It can't work with time. It can't work without time. It can't work within time. And it can't work in this time. It, it would never work because the laws of science have always been the same. <laughs> they never change. Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus Christ, yesterday, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, <clears throat> it gets a little hokier. Now, this is stuff you should share with them. And Grady McMurtry told me, Dr. Grady McMurtry, when I was interviewing him for our film, we were at lunch one time and he said, you know what, Matt? He said, if people actually knew what evolution taught, no one would believe in it. No one. It is hokey, folks. So 34 million years ago, monkeys would have had to have somehow gotten from Africa to South America. Now, evolutionists have tried to come up with different theories as to how they could have got there. And the only way that they could have got there was by water. So they literally believe that the monkeys that you and I Americans evolved from had to make an, a journey well before the pilgrims that they never talk about. Those are the real pilgrims, supposedly, because they made this journey from Africa to South America on rafts. Mm -hmm. On rafts. <laughs> Do you realize there's sharks in the water? And not only that, like if, it, if I was to row a boat... R-O-W-E, row a boat from Africa to South America. It would go about three miles an hour in a straight line, which isn't possible, but let's just go into fantasy land, pretend it's true for the sake of argument. It would take a total of 69 days for me to, get, to row a canoe from Africa to South America. So what are they going to eat? Well, let's say they ate each other. Okay, what do they drink? <laughs> Freshwater animals. They're just like us. I mean, and th they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's okay to own animals. Well, are we animals? Think about that. We're animals according to evolution. 
Evolution has told me one time, I can't believe you're, you're a primitive book because your God made an animal talk. I said, well, aren't we all animals according to evolution? <laughs> yeah, we all speak. So you believe in 7.8 billion talking animals because there's 7.8 billion people on earth. And the Bible only mentions two. Doesn't make any sense. But so they literally think that monkeys got on rafts and they just floated across the ocean. That is so ridiculous. I, I mean, some of this stuff is just so crazy. It's not even really worth naming. It doesn't really get worse than that. But it does. So now uh, they recently discovered in 2018, because I like to use more modern things. In 2018, they did a test on squids and octopi. Now, squids and octopi are really awesome creatures. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but I love them. Um, I would never want to get in the water with one, but I think they're cool creatures. And interestingly enough, they couldn't have evolved from any other sea creature. They're like, well, where's the ancestor? We're looking in the genetic code and we can't find it. So evolutionary theory, a group of 33 scientists said, and I quote, that octopuses and or octopi and squid are extraterrestrial imports from outer space <laughs> to earth so i mean they made a crash landing folks these they say that they hitched a ride that's what the article says on the back of comets and that they came to earth they came to visit us and that they're aliens that's that's the most well established evolutionary theory about where squids and octopi came from I mean, this stuff is weird. It's evolution won in court, not the lab. Let's always remember that. Because it was the U.S. government that said, we have to teach evolution. In the laboratory, creation would win every time. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. You, all you have to do is step outside, look up, open your eyes, and receive some enlightenment. The heavens declare the glory of God. It's, it's that simple. They say, well, that's a bad argument, Matt Pye. I can't believe you'd use such a silly art. It's in the Bible. I believe the Bible. I believe every word of this book. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, interestingly enough, it gets worse. So November 7th, 2020, and this just came out, they're now teaching because dinosaurs had the same predicament. But before I get to that, the reason that they say monkeys had to surf from Africa to South America, when you ask them, where's your evidence for that? Because I just say, it's in your imagination. They'll say, no, we have evidence. What's the evidence? Well, they're like, well, we, we found a monkey that was trying to get on a vegetation mat and it was fossilized and it was over in an area where it shouldn't have been. You're proving the flood, folks. That's just a proof of the flood. It was trying to survive. Like, why else would it try to be hopping on some vegetation mat unless it was being buried by a flood? <laughs> it just is crazy that these people believe this. So, you know, let's go ahead and turn over to Job 40. Job chapter 40. Now, a lot of those students had said, well, the reason that we gave up believing the Bible is because, you know, the Bible mentions dinosaurs, and we know that they never saw dinosaurs, and we know that dinosaurs are 65 million years ago. Well, here's what the Bible says about dinosaurs. Now, remember, Job apparently never saw a dinosaur, according to these people. <clears throat> Job 40, verse 15, it says, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee. So, the Bible says that whatever this creature is, it was made with Job. It was the same time frame. He eateth grass as an ox. And they say, oh, see, we got gotcha. you. That's not a dinosaur. It ate grass. Well, just this past year, they dug up dinosaur feces, which I don't know how it lasted 65 million years. <laughs> but they discovered dinosaur feces, and they tested the feces of the dinosaur. And guess what the dinosaur ate? grass <laughs> the dinosaur ate grass they'll say well dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago grass came into being 55 million years ago so dinosaurs never saw grass 
you just tested the feces and saw that they ate grass. They literally teach that, that grass came into being 10 million years after dinosaurs. So on their, little, uh, on their little website there for science, they updated. Some creationists pointed this out to us, and it was legitimate, so we're going to update it. So now they updated dinosaurs and grass to 55, or 60, grass to 65 million years ago. whoop de doo You know, if you're really a free thinker, you should be asking questions. And you shouldn't be asking vain questions. You should be asking scientific questions. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so somehow this dinosaur feces lasted 65 million years ago. We don't know how. Um, but I find this interesting, too. In 1990, well, first, let's read the rest of the passage. So verse 16, he eateth, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and the force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. So whatever this creature was, which we know it was a brachiosaur probably, it moved its tail like a cedar. Do you guys know of any creature that moves its tail and it's as big as a cedar tree? There's nothing like that out there except a brachiosaur or a dinosaur. So Job was literally talking about dinosaurs. And it's so funny because these people are like, when they discovered dinosaurs and they're chiseling away at the rocks and they're finding all this soft tissue, they're like, oh man, this disproves the Bible. It's like, well, no, this actually confirms what the Bible told you about dinosaurs that you hadn't even dug up yet, but the Bible talked about these people or these dinosaurs, Behemoth and Leviathan. The Bible mentioned them. So <clears throat> let me see. I don't want to uh, lose my thought here. Um, We covered that. Okay, so one of the last things I wanted to cover on uh, the dinosaurs was that in 1990, they dug up dinosaur tissue. Now, it was soft, moist, resilient. You could squeeze the blood right out of the tissue. Now, who here thinks that dinosaur blood could last for 65 million years? Now, what they try to do is they say, and, and they, interestingly enough, check this out. So the lady that made this discovery was an evolutionist. She didn't even believe in creation. Her team, it was Dr. Mary Schweitzer. It says, Mary Jack and their team published the B-Rex findings that they found in a series of papers in the journal Science, which is a big journal. And they were promptly attacked. Critics said that their samples might have been contaminated. Let me ask you a question. If you're a free thinker, and you're looking for evidence, why would you attack somebody for finding evidence that disproves your theory, unless you had a bias? Think about that. They literally attacked her. She was one of them. She was one of their own. And you know, it, it's so crazy. They, they turn on each other. You know, if I'm in a debate, you know, and I, or if one of my friends is in a debate and they don't do very well, let's say maybe they lose a debate. I've seen that happen a couple times. Because, you know, when it comes to debate, it doesn't matter how good you are or at uh, the facts. It depends on how good you can debate sometimes or the questions that you ask. And so, you know, if one of my friends loses in a debate, I will help them up. And I would hope that they would do the same for me if I lost a debate, which I'm sure I have. And so that's what I would hope for. But as an evolutionist, if they lose a debate, they just kick each other out. I mean, look at what happened to, to, to uh, a ra raging atheist. Kicked him out. Oh, he doesn't speak on behalf of our... Well, who does speak on behalf of your community then? I'd like to know. And I'd like to know, is he willing to have a conversation with some of us? They don't have answers for any of this, folks. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> let me see here. So they were, they were attacked. And there's just no way, like, even if you were to put dinosaur soft tissue inside of an airtight jar that was in another airtight jar and another airtight jar, deep time will always cause things to deteriorate. So there's no way that it could have lasted 65 million years. It's lucky that it even lasted 1,000 years. I mean, you look at animals that die out in nature today, they decay almost right away. And so, yeah, it, it's literally crazy. Now, <laughs> it's another thing I wanted to mention. Now, this is pretty hokey, too. Not only did monkeys surf the ocean, 
But for evolution to be true, we have to do some mental gymnastics. Duck-billed dinosaurs. This is the, the, the headline. came out November 7th of 2020, just a week ago. Duck-billed dinosaurs once crossed the ocean. The first duck-billed dinosaur fossil discovered in Africa. And then here's what the article states. It says, because Africa was isolated by the deep oceans at that time, duck-billed dinosaurs must have crossed hundreds of miles of open water, rafting on debris. Has anybody ever seen a dinosaur raft? I mean, you look at their arms. I mean, they're just, there's just no way. <laughs> there's just no way. They would be bobbing around in the ocean and they would be fish bait probably get eaten by a plesiosaur or something. Sherlock Holmes said, or once said, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. It was impossible for them to walk to Africa. The only way for them to get there was through the water. I mean, what, what do you even say to that? I mean, this just came out. This is November 7th, 2020. That is, that and here's the thing, in order for evolution to be true, this stuff had to happen. They want to talk about like it's crazy to believe that, that uh, Mary the Virgin conceived or that a Jewish man like Jesus resurrected, they'll say. Look, they think that every living life form came to life from dead material and resurrected itself. They believe you and I and every other life form came to life out of non-existence. That's a greater resurrection than I believe in. I believe Jesus died and resurrected again. But they believe every living thing came to life out of non-existence. And then they want to tell you you're crazy for believing in a resurrection. They fling their own problems on the Christianity, folks. The fallacy of false equivalence. When they can't have their way, they want to spew their shortcomings on everybody. Well, you know, it's interesting. Would, I like, I'd like to ask these people, would you ever do a debate on the existence of Santa Claus? Would you ever do a debate on the existence of Bugs Bunny or Elmer Fudd? They wouldn't do it. You know what that tells me? That my Lord is legitimate enough in their eyes that they feel like they have to spend their whole life fighting against him. And who defines their, their life by what they don't believe in? It's like you know, when they say, I'm an atheist, just the word atheist is, is ridiculous. Just the word. Because it literally means, I lack belief. That's what they say. It's just, I, I lack belief in God. Well, and you're going to call yourself that? You might as well just say, well, I'm a non-stamp collector. I don't collect stamps. <laughs> I could say, well, I'm a non-stamp collector. Just the word atheist is ridiculous. Just the word. And somebody wants to call themselves that? This guy I interviewed, he's like, yeah, you pretty much hit the nail on the head there, Mr. Powell. That's, why, that's how we define ourselves. Change your definition. Find something better to believe in. You know, they say, well, we don't have any beliefs. Is that your belief that you don't have beliefs? Well, I can't be sure of anything. Well, they seem sure that they're not sure of anything else other than being sure that they can fight against a God and shadow box against something they claim that not even exist. They define their life about disproving something that they think is a fantasy, quote unquote. They would never do the same with Bugs Bunny. They would never do the same with Lord of the Rings. They're like, believing in Jesus is like believing in Lord of the Rings. Well, okay, let's do a three-hour debate on Lord of the Rings then. They won't do it because they know that God is legitimate enough to fight against. And, you know, at the end of the day, the reason that I preach messages similar to this or like this is for one... Well, We've got a documentary on this coming out, and I, I want to make the truth plain and just pave the way so that nobody's confused about fish coming, turning into fishermen over time and all this weird stuff that people now believe. It's weird. But I also just, it just dawned on me that atheists lead the world in school shootings. You know, and it's interesting because Richard Dawkins says, religion is dangerous. Kids, it poisons the mind. Really, is, is that why 97% of school shootings are done by atheists? 
yet Christians have their minds poisoned, according to you, yet Christians have never committed such an act? They say, oh, well, it poisons the mind. Well, why is it that atheists lead the world in drug abuse, suicide, school shootings, and alcohol abuse, and you want me to believe that Christianity is bad? You need to have your brain checked. You need to re-examine your whole entire career, your whole entire life. And I understand that as a celebrity, you have to do things differently. You have to speak what feels good. And you know what? Anybody in this room could probably become popular by just telling everybody what they want to hear. You came from a monkey, boys and girls. All right, we all came from monkeys. That's what we want to hear because we don't want to believe in God. That's how it is. People believe what they want to hear. And then they'll say that we don't know how to think when they themselves are being told what to think, not how to think. And then at the end of their course, they think they know how to think. When they're just being told what to think instead of how to think. Look, you should know how to think. When you read the Bible, it's going to show you how to think. People say, oh, reading the Bible made me an atheist. Well, then you must just hate God. <laughs> you must just hate God. I've heard that before. I've talked to them, and, and they'll try to use the Bible too. And I always tell them, look, I'm not here to have a Bible study with you. I, I'll have a Bible study with a Christian. before. I'll have, let me do it with all my brethren first, and then I'll have a Bible study with you. Let's end with Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> the Bible says in Romans 1.20, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. So they're without excuse, folks. Verse 21, it says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Notice that word, imaginations. I told this guy, just imagine, right? He goes, yep, just imagine. Literally. That's what they do. They just use vain imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They'll say, well, the flood is, I ask them, well, what's the biggest myth? that you think the Bible teaches. They always say the flood. They say the flood's the biggest myth that creationism teaches. It's the number one death blow to your religion because we can all prove that there was never a global flood. Let's, let, let's just falsify that real quick and I'm gonna close out the message. If you were to step outside right now and you look at the ground, what do you see? You see, and this is very simple, but like I said, I wanna keep things simple. In the ground, you're going to see places where animals burrow down in. Groundhog holes, snake holes. You're going to see tree roots everywhere. You're going to see trees growing. Things are constantly going down into the ground, leaving remains in the ground. Well, if you look at the layers of the Grand Canyon, they're made up of uh, layers of sedimentary rock. Now, in between the layers, they say that animals were there and they were able to do... Uh, things for millions of years while layers formed on top of each other. Well, why is it that we don't find any animal holes between the layers like we find outside? If they were millions of years old, wouldn't we expect to see some animals digging down in those holes? Yet we don't find any animal holes in the layers of the Grand Canyon. We also don't find any root remains, right? Because they would have, the trees would have grown in the layers, plants. Wouldn't you expect to find roots? in the layers never find them you know what that proves is that the layers were all deposited at the same exact time and what the evolutionists will say is well the reason we know that we're related to primates and that that the, the layers are millions of years old is because you know we find the clams at the bottom the lizards closer to the bottom the mammals close to the top and the birds at the top that's how we know we evolved over time no, it's just how the flood sorted it when it happened. The flood put all the heavy stuff on the bottom. The lizards, which weren't as heavy, closer to the bottom through hydrologic sorting. This is Science 101. Bill Nye has this video out there. It's called Bill Nye Destroys Noah's Ark. It shows him like kind of crushing it on the thumbnail. It just drove me crazy. And people are like, yeah, preach it, Bill Nye. Look, there was such a dumb argument that he used. He goes, 
well, the reason that we know that, that these layers are different ages is because you've got all the clams at the bottom, all the lizards here, all the mammals here, and all the birds up here. So you can see how we evolved over time. No, it, it's exact. that's what we would expect in a flood. The flood put all the heavy stuff on the bottom, not so heavy, not heavy, and light stuff. The birds would have been flying around. It's no wonder they were, flo they were up at the top and the last ones to get buried. So the Grand Canyon actually pr proves Noah's flood. And just the name, you know how I t mentioned the name atheist? Just the name is contradictory. Just the name itself. The name sedimentary rock, just that phrase, literally means dried out mud. So when you say that the layers of the Grand Canyon are sedimentary, they're admitting that it's dried out mud. That's, they're liter so the definition of the Grand Canyon is literally caused. Sedimentary rock means that it literally was caused by a flood. So just by the definition that the Grand Canyon has, it was, it's proof that it's uh, part of a flood. And that flood would have had to have been so catastrophic, and they'll say that it was to the point where it would have had to have been a global catastrophe. So in closing, folks, you know, the reason that I think messages like this are important is because I don't want people to be deceived. And people are being tricked out there. They'll say, oh, you creationists are con men. You're tricking people. You're trying to get money. No, if I wanted to get money, I would go with the state-endorsed religion, evolution. I would teach all the kids that there was a big explosion where nothing caused nothing to explode, and we evolved from fish. And I could make a lot of money doing that. Creationists are not in this for the money. In fact, every good creation scientist that I've ever known in my life has lost money coming into this. They'll say, oh, you preachers are just con men. You're trying to get people's money. That's not how it is, folks. We don't get any government grants. All the money goes to their, their funds. Like, I can't even do what I do, and I don't want to do what I do full time at all. Like, I, I, I like to do it, but I also have a family and I work a secular job, but I don't have near the equipment or the funding that these people have and it's easy to prove that even with all their equipment and all their man's wisdom and all their funding and all their stuff that they have nothing at the end of the day they don't have any bit of evidence to support their theory not one piece of evidence and so with that being said um, i'm going to go ahead and close with a word of prayer thank you all for coming out this morning and let's go ahead and pray and ask god to bless our departure lord Thank you so much for the family of Christ that's out here. And thank you so much for all the dear brothers. And uh, Lord, what a blessing it's been to see familiar faces and to meet Mrs. Caffone and um, just everybody that has been so, uh, so gracious to have us out here today. And Lord, I just pray you'd bless them with an extra special blessing. And I pray that this message would wake up uh, people that are deceived and, um, Lord, I know I'm not a perfect speaker, but I know that you can speak through your word and you can speak through me if I'll submit myself to you. And Lord, I just uh, thank you once again for this time of fellowship. And I pray in advance and thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey,